Hello everyone and welcome to another APSAD Insight webinar. Uh, my name is Jim Hunt, I'm one of the nurses here with Insight, or the nurse educators I should say, with Insight. Um, to start with I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we're meeting today and I'd like to pay my respects to any elders past, present or emerging. And I'd like to extend that welcome and respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders that might be joining us today in webinar land. So today I think we've got quite an exciting webinar for you. Um, myself and my colleague Sam, who's one of the other nurse educators, we've travelled all over Queensland. Um, and one, one of the things that we regularly get asked for is information about inhalants. Um, so it gives me great pleasure today that I'm going to introduce Cameron Francis, who's a social worker for Dovetail. Dovetail are kind of the sister organisation to Insight, whereas Insight focus on education and support for clinicians for adults. Dovetail focus much more on the adolescent and youth uh, services. So they provide the same kind of su support and services, but for youth. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Cameron Francis, who's going to talk about everything you need to know about inhalants. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, let me just get myself going. Okay, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Jim said, my name is Cameron from Dovetail, and I'm here to do a presentation for you around understanding inhalants and uh, some of the responses to inhalant use in Queensland. But um, before we go much further, I'd also like to acknowledge traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, so just like Jim mentioned, uh, Dovetail, we're a little service uh, that sit alongside Insight. And our service is designed to provide clinical advice and support to any worker or service who works with young people around alcohol and drugs. So we don't work directly with young people or families. We work with services and we help out with clinical advice and training and support. Uh, there's our website, dovetail.org.au. Uh, check it out if you haven't seen it. You can subscribe to our weekly email digest uh, there if you're interested and stay up to date with some of the latest research and practice tools around young people and drugs. So for today's presentation, uh, we're going to be talking about inhalants. And before we go much further, I want to just be clear around some of the terminology. Um, the terms that I prefer to use is inhalant use. Um, it's a general term just to refer the intentional inhalation of a volatile substance in order to change mental state. So it's a pretty simple sort of definition. There's other terms which are things like volatile substance misuse or volatile substance use, VSM, VSU. These are, um, those terms, I mean, they're still quite commonly used. Uh, I tend to try to avoid them just because I'm trying to eliminate acronyms as much as possible. And as soon as you write VSM, VSU, you have to explain to someone what it is. So, I mean, I just prefer to use the term inhalant use to make it a bit more uh, easy to explain to people. Now, there are a few terms that it, it would be good to avoid. Um, the term chroming is one that lots of our young people that people are working with use the term chroming to describe uh, any sort of inhalant use. But in our official communications, it's a good idea to avoid the term chroming just because it's a slang term and the meaning of it's not always clear. Uh, I know for me, starting youth work in the early 2000s, chroming referred to paint sniffing in particular. Uh, you wouldn't use the term chroming to describe someone sniffing deodorant or glue. Um, but whereas nowadays, I think a lot of people use the term chroming to generically refer to any inhalant use. So it is a slang term. If your young people use it, then sure, use it back with them. But if you're writing case notes or in official communications, uh, it is much better to be specific. So I've got an example there. If you were writing a case note, you might write something like a young person presented to the service while intoxicated due to inhalant use, and then note the product uh, as well, particularly the brand, because that does help us when we go to then later on do supply reduction work and look at, you know, where are these inhalable products coming from? It's really useful for us to know specifically what brand or, uh, is being used, whether it's Rexona deodorant or particular brands of glue, because it can help us to identify where the source of that might be. Um, another term we'd like to avoid, volatile substance abuse or VSA. Um, I mean, substance abuse in general is no longer a term that we use here in Australia. Um, it's been removed out of the DSM. We also know that when we use the word abuse, it's actually quite stigmatising uh, to the people who use those substances. So we do try to avoid that. Instead, use terms like inhalant use or, as I said, VSU, VSM. 
Um, another, some other terminology to avoid is things like sniffer or chroma, where we refer to identify a person in terms of their substance use. Um, again, these are stigmatizing to refer to, you know, a group of sniffers came to my service uh, or whatever. Instead, a person who uses inhalants, uh, we don't want to make uh, their, the substance use a core part of a person's identity. So we try to avoid those terms as much as we can. So I won't go into this too much. This is a, a, a slide showing you some stats from the Australian Secondary School Student Survey of Alcohol and Other Drugs, the ASAD survey. This is from 2017, our most recent ASAD. Uh, this one, it does, it shows lifetime substance use. Have you ever used inhalants in your lifetime? And the interesting thing with the inhalants here is that the highest race, rates of use occur in the youngest age group. So amongst the 12 year olds, it's about 19% of lifetime use of inhalants. And as people get older, so the blue bar there is 17, the lifetime rate of use declines, which is a little unusual. Um, we know that inhalant use is, is generally associated with younger age groups. We know that by the age of about 15 or 16, a lot of young people age out of inhalant use, and that's partly because they get access to, whoops, they get access to income, uh, and then switch to alcohol, cannabis, or other drugs. So inhalant use is a substance associated with the very young age group. Um, one of the major challenges with responding to inhalant use is actually the age of some of the young people involved. Um, the ASAD survey on the screen there, that's focused on high school age young people in Australia. We know that it's probably missing out on disengaged uh, young people who are not at school, obviously, but it commences at age 12. If we were to ask uh, eight and nine year olds in the general community, have they ever used inhalants, we would be detecting inhalant use. Uh, most of this use though we know is experimental. There's another question in the ASAD survey which asks, have you used inhalants 10 or more times? And that number drops significantly down to a between one and 2%. So what we kind of have with the inhalant use is quite a large number of young people, nearly, nearly one in five, according to the ASAD survey, have used inhalants, but most of them are probably experimental and they won't go on to use it more than once or twice. The, the group we're most interested in, the group I'm really focusing on today is actually that one or 2% who go on to use regularly. This is a different group of young people to your usual mainstream young people. And our responses to this group who are chronically and heavily using inhalants is a bit different as well. So that is really the focus of today's talk. Um, I did dig out some stats looking at inhalant use over time, just to look at the trend, like are we seeing an increase? And I mean, these school-based surveys are not, not necessarily a great way of tracking drug use trends. It does miss local variation. We know that there are some highly localised trends of inhalant use where we might have an outbreak just in one particular community and nowhere else. So uh, large population studies kind of miss a bit of that diversity. But I did think it's interesting just to look back into the mid 90s where we had nearly 29% 20, of young people in 1996 reporting ever used inhalants. Uh, that's probably in line with a whole bunch of other drug use trends around that time. We had high rates of cannabis use, nearly double the rate we have today back then as well. Um, the interesting thing is amongst the, we haven't seen a massive increase amongst the younger group, except in the 16 to 17 year olds from 2014 to 2017, it does appear to be an increase. Uh, my suspicion of that increase though, is that that's probably related to nitrous oxide, which I'll talk only briefly about today. Um, so Dovetail conducted a little study, uh, which we published last year, uh, a census of young people in youth drug and alcohol treatment in Queensland. So it's not exactly representative. We just asked youth drug and alcohol workers to answer some questions about all of the clients they had open on their books on a nominal day, just to get a snapshot, uh, a snapshot in time. And this, um, these stats that you're seeing on the screen here are looking for, has your client used inhalants in the last four weeks? Um, we found 10% of the female clients in youth drug and alcohol treatment had used inhalants in the last month, compared with only 1% of the male clients, which is quite a significant gender difference. Uh, we also saw uh, uh, much higher rates of occurring in the youngest age group. So amongst those 12 to 15, 31% had reported using inhalants in the past month. Uh, we also saw a slight uh, a slight bit, um, bias towards Aboriginal young people as well, with about 8% of Aboriginal young people reporting recent inhalant use, compared with 2% of non-Indigenous young people. Having said that, our, we do have some sample bias in this study. We did include services that focus particularly on Aboriginal young people, so that, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stat is not exactly representative. 
um, but it does give us a bit of a snapshot of what we're, what we're seeing in our treatment services. But I just wanted to point out too, though, that inhalant use is not just something we see here in Australia. It's actually common all over the world, uh, in mostly amongst the most disadvantaged young people. So there are significant inhalant problems in countries like Mexico, uh, across South America, particularly Brazil. Um, a number of African countries have got significant issues with inhalants. Uh, so too Southeast Asia, um, Indonesia has some significant problems uh, and India as well. It does seem that inhalant use is generally used by the most disadvantaged young people in our communities. And that's because of the availability of these volatile hydrocarbons is that they, no matter if you're a homeless, you know, a homeless young person in Brazil, uh, you can still get access to glue. And so that's uh, something that's worth pointing out. Um, I'll also mention too that these inhalant issues have really been going since at least the 1950s. And that's probably because that's when a lot of these hydrocarbons were widely available in the community. Uh, the inhalant problems we're dealing with today are not new. Uh, we do see inhalant problems coming through our community in waves, which I'll talk about a little bit more as we go. So why do young people use inhalants? Uh, there's, you know, there's a bit of research in this area, although honestly not a huge amount. Um, we know that, oh, and I'm not talking about that 19% group who I mentioned before, the experimental group. If, if we were asking a lot of those experimental young people, why did they use inhalants? A lot of them would tell us that they were curious. They wanted to see what it did. With this group that are using much more heavily, this one or 2% group who are using chronic, chronically, uh, I think some of the reasons are probably more related to things like stress, grief and trauma, um, boredom and loneliness. We know that there is some uh, links to hunger, reducing hunger pains for young people who might be homeless, uh, obviously blocking physical and emotional pain, and also the availability of inhalants because they are so widely available. Now I'm going to, throughout the presentation today, I've actually pulled out some quotes from some research conducted by a youth service up in Cairns called Yeti, who did a research report back in 2014 where they interviewed young people who used inhalants and they asked them, why do you use inhalants? They also asked them about, you know, uh, what, what, what could a worker do that was helpful? So throughout today's presentation, I've included some quotes from some young people just so we can hear their voices in, in some of this work. And um, this is what the young people up in Cairns talked about. One said, it eases your mind, clears out my mind, everything that's there. Sometimes when I have everything in my mind, it's hard to come out, I just sniff. Another one, lately I've been thinking of sniffing. I'm so stressed out, the only way people will leave me alone is if I'm sniffing. And these two, I sniffed because I like the feeling of it. It made me feel high like it wasn't me here. And this last one, I felt like I wasn't wanted and that's why I sniffed, which is a pretty sad kind of, uh, a sad sort of reason. Um, as I was putting together this presentation, I did find the first published case report of petrol sniffing in Australia, which was from 1963 in the Medical Journal of Australia. And in that report, it's quite interesting. Uh, the, one of the lines in the reports just says that it would appear that the boy's need to sniff petrol vapour was related to his broken home life, his unsuitable foster placement and changes of his school. And that was back in 1963. So it's interesting hearing that now when really we do see a lot of these young people having significant trauma backgrounds. Um, this is another little a study I came across while I was putting this presentation together. Really interesting study from Victoria in conjunction with some researchers from the Northern Territory. They uh, interviewed adults who were filling up their cars with petrol. And while they're exposed to the ambient petrol fumes, they, they asked these people, adults, to rate how pleasant or and intense they found the smell. And there was a correlation between the ratings of pleasantness and intensity and the time since last meal. So that the people in this study who were the most hungry found the smell of petrol the most pleasing. Now it's a pretty fascinating little study I think because uh, I know a lot of youth workers talk about this around young people who are homeless in particular uh, sniffing in order to reduce their feelings of hunger. Um, also we know lots of young people after they have been sniffing for a while if they come into a youth service and they you know recover from the effects of inhalant use they are finding themselves really hungry because they haven't eaten for such a long time. So it's important I think to keep in mind some of these really practical reasons that young people might be using um, inhalants like petrol. 
We know though that inhalant use is cyclical. It comes in waves and there's a whole bunch of theories around this. The Musto effect is one that I quite like. Um, Musto is a mathematician who did a lot of mathematical modeling of the crack cocaine epidemic in the US. And he really describes this pattern whereby initiation of a substance occurs, people enjoy it. They tell their friends who also enjoy it. Over time, the problems start to build up and the pro problems are witnessed by other people in the community. And as those negative experiences are witnessed, then the next sort of group of people decide not to use the substance and then the rates decline. I think that these cycles are quite um, distinct with inhalant use because we are talking about young people. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a lot of them do age out of their inhalant use kind of naturally as they get older, as they become adults, they do tend to sort of move out of it. So what that means is that we do see these sort of four or five year cycles in the community where our inhalant use levels pick up quite significantly. And then they do seem to decline again. Um, I first started uh, youth work and social work in the early 2000s and it was paint sniffing back then when I started, it was all spray paint, um, very high rates of use, it was causing significant problems all across Queensland, um, there was a lot of work done around addressing that. Uh, by 2006, 2007, the rates of paint sniffing really declined. Uh, we didn't see that much for a little while. Then in about 2011, 2012, we saw a bit of an upswing of glue sniffing here in Brisbane. That sort of declined after a few years. And now here we are again uh, with some quite significant inhalant issues once more. One of the challenges with this cyclical nature of inhalant use is that we get what I've been calling organisational amnesia whereby services uh, develop when the inhalant outbreak is underway. We often spend time getting together, working on collaborative responses to the inhalant use until we get things under control. Within a few years, we lose that organisational memory and we forget about how to respond to inhalant use. And when it comes back in a few years time, it's kind of like rediscovering it all over again. And we do have this Groundhog Day feeling uh, whereby we feel like we forget some of what we already know. Um, and so, you know, we have, there has been some awesome work that's happened all around Australia to manage inhalant use over the years. And particularly in Queensland, there's been some great work done. Um, services like the Indigenous Youth Health Service or AICS did the Get Real Challenge, an activity-based program that was proven to reduce inhalant use in young people. Um, that's a number of years ago. Excellent program. A Brisbane Youth Service is another one, ran really similar programs which were evaluated, found to be quite successful. So I think we do continually forget uh, that, that, you know, we've been through this before, we do know how to respond. Uh, one of the challenges though is that once inhalant use does decline, everyone packs up and goes home. Uh, and sort of forgets about it until we see it again, which is a bit of a shame. So there's a whole bunch of different products which can be inhaled, and I'm not talking about all of them today. I'm gonna to focus only on a few. They're quite hard to categorize. I've tried to categorize them by the, chem by the type, by the actual chemical makeup. Um, what the, the chemicals that we're most concerned about and that I'm mostly gonna talk about today are the volatile hydrocarbons, particularly the aromatic and the aliphatic um, hydrocarbons. You can see that there's some different chemicals. So the benzene, toluene, xylene, sort of classic solvents. Uh, the aromatic hydrocarbons found in things like glue spray paints and petrol and the aliphatic hydrocarbons and these are more like the gas type uh, gas sort of products which are things like butane or isobutane propane um, these are found also in spray paints and glues as propellants or, uh, and um, deodorants but also barbecue gas uh, and petrol as well Probably a little less common are the halogenated hydrocarbons. And these are things like freons and tetrafluoroethane and a few other chemicals. Um, these are refrigerants or used in air conditioners, also computer duster or dust removing sprays. Um, these products are not commonly misused in Australia and they are co more commonly misused overseas. Uh, so we don't wanna speak about these products to young people in Australia because we don't want them to learn of their existence. They're really dangerous, uh, but they are out there and, and they're have been occasional cases where someone has got into the computer duster. Um, there are also ketones like acetone, although again, we don't see that much misuse of things like acetone. The other two which don't fit in that sort of category are the alkyl nitrates, things like amyl nitrite or isobutyl nitrate or poppers. Um, now these are, we're not really gonna cover these today. The, the amyl nitrate is a, a sexual enhancer uh, that people use to facilitate sexual contact. 
Uh, they're generally sold behind the counter in adult shops, so not as easily available to disadvantage young people in particular. But the, um, these volatile nitrites really don't have any of the similar effects to, to those hydrocarbons. Uh, likewise, nitrous oxide or NANGs, whipped cream charges, uh, whatever you want to call it, laughing gas from the dentist. Um, nitrous oxide, we have had an increase in the use of nitrous oxide, but it is a, bit, a little bit expensive, about $10 for a box of whipped cream charges, and they're, they're generally behind the counter in most retail outlets. So uh, while, while there are some issues with nitrous and, and NANGs, uh, we don't see the problems that the whole volatile hydrocarbons cause. I um, will also say that nitrous oxide, while it can cause B12 deficiency, or people can have accidents or injuries under the influence, it doesn't cause the significant cognitive impacts that the hydrocarbons do. Uh, so there's a picture of whippets or nangs, if you're not familiar with cream charges for nitrous oxide. Uh, and there's some uh, bottles of amyl nitrate or poppers if, you've, if you are unfamiliar with the nitrites. But we'll go through the volatile hydrocarbons now, because this is what we're mostly concerned about. So I'll start with the spray paint. And here on the screen, there is an image of chroming, of the spraying of generally chrome-based paints, but not always. Um, it's a slang term describing paint inhalation. So it, when someone sprays spray paint, there's two things in the spray paint. There's a propellant, which gets the paint out of the can, and that's butane or isobutane. And then there's a solvent, and the solvent keeps the paint liquid until it dries on, onto the surface. And that solvent is usually something like toluene or benzene. So spray paint is a combination of hydrocarbons. Um, when someone sprays that into a plastic bottle, like a water bottle, the paint will actually stick to the walls of the bottle, whereas those volatile hydrocarbons are lighter than air. And so the volatile hydrocarbons will basically float out of the lid of the bottle. Uh, the bottle is effectively filtering out the paint so that the person is inhaling just the hydrocarbon. Um, occasionally people do sniff spray paint out of plastic bags. That's quite dangerous to do that because you can actually inhale spray paint and the paint itself can dry inside the lungs and cause suffocation. Uh, so bottles are the more common way that paint would be inhaled. Um, here's a quote from the Yeti research from Cairns. Uh, the main colours I was only sniffing was plum purple and navy blue. And when they didn't have that on the shelf, that's when I would have went for the other colours. Every other colour that smelt good. I used to spray paint into the lid before I buy it, because if it's got a yucky smell to it, I wouldn't buy it. Now, lots of young people did report different psychoactive effects from different colours, in this case, purple and blue. Um, other young people thought the black paint was good, the yellow was not so good. Um, there, there might be something in that. There might be some different combination of solvents that does cause a different psychoactive effect. But also, it might just be, it might be placebo, you know, it might be expectancy. It might be that someone uh, was taught to sniff purple paint, and so that's their, pre their preference. So we do see these sorts of preferences that occur across particular peer groups. Um, glue sniffing uh, involves usually putting a small amount of glue, often into a plastic bag and then inhaling the vapours. Uh, so not all glues are inhalable. Like most glues which are listed as non-toxic, like your glue stick that your kids might use at school, these are all quite safe. It's generally more of the industrial kind of glues and things like rubber glue, rubber cement, in this case is a picture of Oakwood shoe glue, which is quite popular in Brisbane right now. Um, they're generally more of those industrial sorts of glues. Um, they, often they are often flammable. They have a little flammable symbol on them. Uh, they'll often have like the caution sorts of uh, signs on them like this one does. So people do sometimes sniff glue out of bottles, although it's not less common because people tend to try to get, uh, to increase the, um, the content of the hydrocarbon in their blood by inhaling and exhaling into often a plastic bag. Uh, so he, this is an image here, a little illustration of bagging or huffing is the term people might use for it. Um, and a quote from the Yeti research, a young person says, plastic bags is better. You get high quick. When you sniff through plastic bags, you see different colours like rainbows everywhere. That's how high and how quick you get high. So by rebreathing into the bag, they're basically dropping their blood oxygen and they're increasing the level of hydrocarbon to get that much stronger effect. Um, sniffing out of plastic bags is a whole bunch of increased risks from doing that, aside from the average risks of inhalant use. But we do know there have been young people who've died from suffocating into plastic bags. Uh, so that people can pass out into the bag if the bag is on the mouth and they can fall forward and collapse, sealing off their mouth. Uh, we have also had people who've put the bag over their head 
uh, probably while intoxicated and uh, a bit out of it. Uh, and there's also been some uh, asphyxiation that looks like suicide and sometimes a little bit hard to actually tease out, was this deliberate or was that per misadventure? You know, was a person really intoxicated when they've done that? Um, aerosol sniffing though, I think aerosol use is probably our big one in Queensland right now, particularly Rexona deodorant. Um, these sorts, of, so almost every aerosol that's out there uses the propellants butane or isobutane. Uh, we got rid of CFCs a number of years ago because they damaged the ozone layer and we replaced them with things like butane. So pretty much every aerosol that you've got in your cupboard at home uh, would, inc would contain butane and that includes things like spray oils, air fresheners, fly sprays, you name it. Um, the deodorants are popular partly because when someone sprays that deodorant through some fabric like a sock or a sleeve of your shirt or something like that, the fabric is actually capturing some of, of, some of the fragrance and the antiperspirant, uh, which comes in a bit in a powdered form. And so by spraying deodorant through a sock, you're filtering out the powder and the fragrance that you don't really want in order to get more pure butane. So having said that, you know, people can and do sniff things like fly sprays or air fresheners. Uh, often though, you'll find that that's not a preference. And that is partly because if you spray, spray air freshener through a sock, the fragrance is going to come into your mouth as well and probably taste kind of gross. Um, so people also ask us why Rexona in particular, why not other brands of deodorant? And look, it's, it isn't just Rexona. It is actually a whole range of different brands of deodorant. Um, Rexona is, has the largest market share of the deodorant market. Um, next time you're at Coles, just have a look at or Woolies, have a look at how much a shelf space is taken up by Rexona. It's, it's a really high, um, popular product. It takes up a lot of shelf space. It's also sold in a number of retail outlets that maybe don't sell any other deodorant. So, you know, some petrol stations will sell Rexona or 7-Eleven will sell Rexona, but maybe no other brand. So it's not, there's nothing, there's nothing special about Rexona. There's nothing different about its ingredients compared to other products. Um, I do think though too, there does, there has now sort of formed a bit of a subculture around it. I mean, you, I know in Queensland, the young people have slang terms for it like Rex, or Rexies, let's go Rexen, those kinds of things. So uh, it does at some point take on some subcultural kind of um, uh, importance. Uh, also, we know that uh, you know, if in a peer group, if I, if someone taught someone else to sniff Rexona, some of our young people think that Rexona is the only one that I can sniff. So that that's kind of why Rexona seems to be uh, so popular. Um, here's another quote from the research from Yeti. Uh, when I was sniffing deodorant, I used to talk to a person that was not real. I would see a person. Glue, I never saw anybody. It was something like a game. Sniffing deodorant, you would actually see people. So you can see some of the different psychoactive effects there that that young person is describing. Um, so petrol, I'm not going to talk in a huge amount of detail about petrol today. Um, petrol is a fairly complicated product. It contains a whole range of different volatile hydrocarbons, including benzene and in some cases toluene, a whole range of different products. We generally don't see huge amounts of petrol sniffing in urban environments in Queensland. We do have some petrol sniffing in a couple of remote Aboriginal communities. Although I have to say at the moment, it does sound like the uh, things have been on the decline. It does sound like things are being managed pretty well at the moment. Uh, having said that in the past, there have been times when we've had quite significant outbreaks of petrol, of petrol use. Um, petrol of all of the volatile hydrocarbons, petrol can cause some of the most significant cognitive damage and some of the most significant neurological damage. Um, when people sniff petrol for long periods of time, it can eventually impact their ability to walk and can create some really serious permanent disability, um, aside from the, the other short-term effects of petrol sniffing as well. So petrol can have some really serious impacts. We have been able to manage petrol sniffing in a number of communities by using low aromatic fuel. Uh, you might, people might be familiar with Opal fuel. O Opal is a brand name of the BP low aromatic product. But opal fuel or low aromatic fuel is petrol that's got the volatile component removed. So it does still contain some harmful ingredients like toluene and benzene and a few other things, but they've lowered the volatility in it so that you don't actually get intoxicated from it. Having said that, people can still sniff low aromatic fuel and can still experience harm from it, but they don't get intoxicated from it. 
So we know that where low aromatic fuel has been used and where we've got good coverage, like particularly in central Australia, where you know every petrol station signed up and we got large scale coverage across that area, significant reductions in petrol sniffing, uh, about 88% across the communities that were surveyed not long after it was introduced. Now there was still some sniffing occurring, however, those the rates are much lower and much easier for the communities to respond to. Before aromatic fuel came along, there were times when in some communities, the numbers of people sniffing would get so significant that the community itself was just struggling to manage that. aromatic fuel manages to get those numbers under control. Um, I will just mention too, I won't go into this in much detail, but there's a number of myths and misinformation about low aromatic fuel, uh, including things like it damages your boat engine or that you can still get high from it if you mix a, a styrofoam cup into it. These are all myths. They are wrong and false. And if you hear of them being perpetrated in a community, please let us know um, because we know that when communities have taken on board some of these myths, have then chosen to get rid of low aromatic fuel because they think it's damaging their boat engines and it's inevitable and it is happened a number of times that the petrol sniffing comes back significantly. So um, we know that low aromatic fuel does not damage your boat engine. You cannot get intoxicated from it. There is no way to turn it from low aromatic into now suddenly volatile again. It is chemically impossible. Uh, so yeah, uh, we, it, is, it is very, very effective in the communities where it's being used. So how do the inhalants work? So again, I'm talking about volatile hydrocarbons in this section. The fumes enter the bloodstream really quickly. Um, effects are almost instant. Um, the hydrocarbons are, are central nervous system depressants. So they work on either glutamate or GABA receptors, mostly GABA. Um, GABA receptors are the same receptors that are in that alcohol works on or benzodiazepines is as an example as well. So if you, un you understand how alcohol works, you can kind of understand a little bit about what some of the effects of the inhalants might be. It does slow down the breathing, slows down heart rate. Um, the high from inhalant use doesn't last long. And so people continue to top up over time, which is why you might see young people wandering around with a can of Rexona underneath their shirt. Uh, and they might be sniffing in some cases all day um, and going through you know, 20, 30, 40 cans of Rexona in a day uh, or sniffing petrol, for example, out of a cup. And that, that is, uh, will last them for hours and hours and hours. One of the biggest concerns we've got with the inhalant use, and this is one of our major problems at the moment, is the risks of sudden sniffing death. And people have probably heard of it. It's probably well known, sudden sniffing death. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't know very much about how it really works. So the theory behind it, and this is there's a biological theory around this, is that when people are sniffing hydrocarbons, the heart becomes sensitive to the catecholamines that get released on physical exertion. So the classic scenario being, you know, some kids are sniffing behind the tennis sheds and they think the police are coming so they all get up and run and that sudden physical exertion that sudden rapid change in heart rate causes a fatal arrhythmia now we know from research in spray painters who, who spray paint for a living there is evidence showing that long-term exposure to toluene in spray paint causes an increase in the qt dispersal uh, so for the medical medical people will understand that if you're non-medical don't worry about it um, but on the ecg we know that an increased qt dispersal is an, uh, in, is a marker for potential sudden death sudden cardiac arrhythmia the now we've always known about we've known about sudden sniffing death for a long time However, we know that many of the deaths that have happened in Queensland in the last probably five years have not involved any physical exertion. They have not involved the scenario of getting up and running away. There have been cases of kids who are sniffing at home in their bedrooms and they have had the, the fatal arrhythmia. So while physical exertion, we know that that's technically a risk, that's not the only risk. And we don't know exactly why that might be. Um, it does seem that butane has a higher risk of inducing sudden sniffing death than some of the other products. We think that butane is higher risk than things like uh, toluene or, uh, or higher risk than, th than some of the chemicals in petrol. It's most likely that sudden sniffing death involves a whole bunch of different underlying mechanisms that we don't understand. We think some young people are probably more vulnerable than others. And these would be young people who've got some kind of history of a cardiac condition. Uh, not all young people would know they've got a, a history of a cardiac condition, but there are a few guesses we can make. Like we know that rheumatic heart, 
uh, is quite endemic in tropical areas in Aboriginal communities. And I think I would be assuming rheumatic heart history would put a young person at much more risk of sudden sniffing death than a young person who does not have rheumatic heart. But having said that, we actually don't have research in that. And the, the research around sudden sniffing death as a particular syndrome is actually quite flimsy. Um, it's surprisingly flimsy uh, given the numbers of deaths that we have had. And I will point out, we don't exactly know how many people have died in Queensland from inhalant use over the last several years. Um, we know of within those that have been reported in the media, it's probably five or six uh, young people aged under 18, although I'm assuming that there are more who are not um, counted. So it would be quite interesting to have a look at some of the characteristics of that to understand a little bit better about what's going on. Now, the risk of sudden sniffing death does have impacts on our work with young people. Uh, I, we know that diversionary activity-based programs are some of the most effective interventions for these young people, but we should be very cautious of setting up programs that do involve physical activity, physical exertion, because that could, that could be a risk of sudden sniffing death. So if you're in a youth service and you do activity-based programming, just keep that in mind and think about how it is that you structure some maybe low intensity activities um, and also screen screening young people around how recently have they used inhalants before they participate in an activity. Our general advice to services is that you'd want young people to have not sniffed for 24 hours before they participate in some kind of physical activity. But be careful because, you know, if you if you exclude someone because they admit to sniffing, then they're not going to admit to sniffing. So uh, we, uh, a number of youth services we work with um, have multiple different activities so that if you have been sniffing, all right, you can't do this activity today, you can do this one instead. And so you're not sort of excluding them based on that because you want the honesty, you want people to tell you what they're doing. Um, so, but you also don't want to put them at risk. There's a range of other health risks um, from inhalant use. Um, accidents and injuries is one, and this is being you know, under the influence and hurting yourself. We have had um, here in, in Southeast Queensland, a number of severe burns caused by butane of uh, young people sniffing in enclosed environments and the butane has filled up the bedroom or you know, filled a tent where they've been sleeping and then someone has lit a cigarette or something and they've ignited. Uh, we've also had uh, people have falls and head injuries under the influence. There can be a range of like cough, breathlessness, pneumonia, including aspiration pneumonia, where uh, someone may have inhaled a small amount of vomit while they've been intoxicated, and that's then turned into a chest infection or pneumonia. Uh, sometimes that's missed because we, we sort of don't think too much about someone who coughs from sniffing, because of course you're coughing, sniffing is irritating for your lungs, but it can actually be pneumonia. Um, there can be some neurological and cognitive impairments, although I think we should be careful not to overstate these. I think that the neurological and cognitive damage is particularly associated with things like toluene and also petrol sniffing, probably less so butane and Rexona. Um, I think also that we, we, if we... Uh, tell young people that uh, will focus on brain damage uh, from sniffing, then it does tell young people, oh, well, I've damaged my brain, there's no point in me stopping. When actually I've seen young people recover from quite significant, what I thought was significant neurological damage, uh, and they have recovered uh, on a couple of weeks of abstinence and good food and good diet. So I think we need to, well, yes, there can be cognitive impairments, particularly short-term memory can be the first one, but uh, as something like petrol sniffing damage progresses, it progresses to movement disorders and problems with fine motor control. Uh, yeah, a whole range of other issues relating to their motor control. Um, there's also things like dermatitis, particularly contact dermatitis. And there is some de evidence of de a dependence syndrome as well that looks just like other sorts of dependence syndromes. Um, but this is what some young people were talking about. This is from the Yeti research. And I think this is really good to focus on because, you know, we as workers get concerned about neurological damage. But for a 14 year old, that's so abstract and weird. Uh, but this is what the young people were concerned about. I do get chest pain from the sniffing. It makes my eyes are so sore and blurry. And it does make your whole throat here so sore. That's why I lost a lot of weight. That's because of the sniffing. I don't eat when I'm sniffing. I can't eat. Uh, the next one, sometimes my eyes close up and go blurry. That's from the fumes itself that go up under your eyelashes with the paint fumes or the glue fumes. Everyone gets it. So they're talking about direct contact on their face and how irritating that is. And the last one is a mental health one. I ended up going to mental health. So I talked about, I think I got a crack in my head. And then I thought I had a crack in my head, but it wasn't a crack. Then I just started talking about like I've been sniffing and I've been seeing things and hearing things. 
Um, this young person went on to say uh, afterwards, the doctor said I had schizophrenia. So this is um, potentially the inhalant use has, has either been co-occurring with the severe mental illness or it may have in some, potentially induced a psychotic illness in that young person. Uh, so I'm going to switch to how we respond now to intoxication and young people using inhalants. We get asked a lot from youth services around how to respond to acute intoxication, particularly a young person comes into a service intoxicated or outreach workers are encountering young people in public spaces. Um, obviously, first up is ensuring the safety of yourself and your colleagues. Um, it's worth approaching someone using inhalant slowly because they, it's a CNS depressant, it takes someone a while to realise you're there. So if, say, they're in a park, just stand nearby for a little while first and wait for them to sort of slowly uh, work out that you're there. Don't go rushing in. Also be aware that the volatile hydrocarbons are flammable. Um, so open the doors and windows and you can get intoxicated yourself if you're in a confined environment. So do open the windows, including in the car. You don't want to get high while you're driving them somewhere. Um, also just be mindful of injuries or medical issues a person might have. Uh, I mean, no, someone might be sniffing, but they might also have diabetes. They might also have a head injury. Uh, and sometimes that we know that the inhalant use has actually masked other health problems that are going on. Um, these are a couple of slides I just thought I'd throw in as well around just de-escalation because, because these are CNS depressants, we know it disinhibits people's behaviour. Um, some workers report sudden changes in mood and a young person might go from kind of relaxed to agitated sort of quickly. Um, so we just sort of throw in a couple of de-escalation strategies as well. The safer model is a good one. It's easy to remember. Step back, assess the situation, find some help, evaluate your options and then respond. Really take your time. Uh, before you go rushing in and evaluate how things are going, evaluate, you know, try to have a chat and be friendly and see does that work or not work and then modify your response. The PALMS model is another really good one, easy to remember. Consider your position where you physically are standing and don't block the exits. Maintain a good, calm, positive attitude. Remain happy and don't go in being all shouty. Um, look and listen. Keep make regular eye contact and check in with the person. Keep some space. You want to have a bit of distance and have your stance side on. You don't want a full-on threatening stance where you stand over someone. When a person is really intoxicated from inhalants, um, they a lot of workers will say oh that you know they have the 10,000 mile stare it's like they don't even know i'm there they might not be responding to you, but they're hearing everything that you say. Uh, and another line that I've heard before around the place is that a person might not remember what you say to them in this state, but they'll remember how you made them feel. They might not follow verbal instructions, but your body language will be communicating a lot more to them in that state. So really consider how you are um, physically standing and physically engaging with them uh, in some of these settings. So, now, again, if, you, now if you've done that, you've got everything is kind of calm, you want some fresh air. Now, we want to try and remove the substance if we can. So say you're at your youth service, young person rocks up, sniffing Rex owner. We want to have a chat with them at the doorway while they're intoxicated, and we want to get them to put their Rex owner down. We can't have them coming inside our service and while we stand there supervising them sniffing. So we want to basically work out a way of negotiating them to put it down. Now, this is really tricky. It depends on your setting. It depends where you are. If you've got a main road outside, this one's going to look different to if you're in a nice, calm, quiet environment, or if it's in the middle of the night, this is going to look different. So wherever you are, we'll determine a bit about how this might work. Um, some services do things like, hey, why don't you come and get some food, or offer an incentive to come inside, um, or, you know, would you, would you like us to help drive you home? Or we can't drive you home while you're sniffing. Why don't you put the Rexona down, come have a cup of Milo, and then we can drive you home. A whole range of different strategies that you can use to try and negotiate. Obviously, don't chase, argue, force. We're not going to do any magical counselling. We're not going to change any lives while people are intoxicated. But we're going to be nice to them and engage nicely and be calm and encourage them to hand, either hand you the substance or put it down, some, whatever your policy is for your agency. If you don't have a policy in your service, you should probably get one. Um, some services will take a product from a young person. Others will say, no, I can't take it, but put it in the bin over there, whatever your policy might be. Um, now, how long you're going to do this for, it depends on where you are. You can't probably stand there for, you know, two hours while someone sniffs in front of you. That might not be okay because it starts to look like, well, you're just kind of watching them sniff. 
Um, what we would generally say, I mean, one service we work with, they have a 15 minute guideline, which is basically if workers negotiating for about 15 minutes for a young person to stop, at the end of 15 minutes, if they're still sniffing, it's we're going to have to reassess what we're going to do because we can't sort of stand there all day. So have a think about, you know, it's not, not probably not good to put a hard fixed limit on that because the circumstances vary. But workers do need some guidance around like how long is this okay for me to keep trying to get this to work. So once they've stopped sniffing, so assuming you've got them to put hand the Rexona over, whatever, um, the effects wear off really quickly. It doesn't last long. The inhalants don't last long at all. They should start to recover from the effects within 10 to 15 minutes, really. Um, it can be a bit longer if they've been sniffing all day. It might be a little bit delayed. But in general, in 10 to 15 minutes, you'll start to see signs of improvement. And by 30 minutes to 45 minute mark, should be all back to normal maybe up to 45 to an hour, as I say, if they've been sniffing all day. But even then, if they have been sniffing heavily, they, they, you should still see pr progress. You should see, see them recovering and getting better. Their awareness will increase. They'll respond appropriately. They'll start talking to you normally again. We want to put them somewhere quiet uh, and safe and monitor them and continue to monitor them to watch them recover. Uh, if once they've recovered, once they're aware and they're answering your questions properly, just check in as to how they're feeling because the, uh, a lot of these hydrocarbons work on the GABA receptors like alcohol so that when people stop using, they actually have a bit of a hangover effect. They can have sometimes, they can feel, have a bit of anxiety. They might be quite hungry. They can have the headaches. Their throat's really sore, whatever. So as it's worn off, sometimes people, people feel a bit crappy at the end of it. So check in on how they are feeling physically and emotionally. I know one young fellow I worked with after he stopped sniffing, he says, oh, my foot's really sore. And we took his shoe off and it, he'd swollen, he'd sprained his ankle and he'd been walking around on it all night, but he couldn't feel it because he was sniffing. It was only once he stopped that he realised he'd hurt himself. So once they've started to recover like that, we'd offer them some water. Um, if they can swallow the water okay, it's all right for us to offer them some food. Um, if you give them some water and they pour it and it just spills down their face, they're not swallowing properly, so don't give them any food. But if they can drink the water okay, then offer them something easy, easy to swallow, things like yogurt or breakfast cereal with milk or something like that, Milo, whatever. Um, a lot of young people get hungry, as I mentioned earlier, once they've stopped. So food is also a, here's a little trick for you. If you need to keep someone there to monitor them, recovering, which you might want to keep them for an hour, they probably don't want to stay for an hour, keep trickling out food. So start with Milo, then say, I'll make you some toast in five minutes. And then in another 10 minutes, I'll get you some Tim Tams and trickle out the food over time. And you can stretch your engagement out and try and keep them in your service as long as you can to make sure that they recover properly. Um, this isn't such an issue for Rexona or the deodorants, but if they're sniffing things like paints or glues some, or petrol, the hydrocarbons get into the clothing and can keep on leaching out of their clothing. So some, particularly petrol, their clothing can remain flammable after they've stopped sniffing. So if they've been sniffing things like glues or paints or petrol and you can smell it strongly on them, you probably want to see if you can get a change of clothes for them because those uh, hydrocarbons will keep coming out of the clothes. Um, now, this is for the medical people online. If you're not in a medical setting, don't worry about this stuff. But we have been looking at some of the medical management of these cases. And as I mean, there's not that much research around, although we have been looking at there's a service called uptodate.com, which does medical guidelines. And they've got actually a really good one from the US around inhalant intoxication, uh, which I think is actually pretty good. Um, so everyone who's using inhalants should have, at the minimum, rapid blood glucose, pulse oximetry, and an ECG. Now, the ECG is to look for changes to the QT interval. Uh, what we probably want is actually two ECGs, and that would be one on admission, and it would be one on exit. The first one on admission is to, so we, if they are intoxicated on admission, we might expect a prolonged QT interval on the first ECG. But then if we do another ECG in an hour after they've recovered, we sh should see that return to normal. Now, if that does not return to normal, it requires more investigation. So I think now that's tr easier said than done when we've got young people who are wanting to self-discharge uh, out of a hospital. And this is this we know that this happens. So there is a balance between what you are, what would be awesome medical practice versus what you can realistically achieve. 
Um, in addition to that, as a minimum, though, some of the other things that we might want to do, depending on which products I've been using, is a complete blood count. We know that the benzenes in petrol can cause bone marrow suppression in people, and that can, in some cases, turn into quite serious blood disorders. So anyone who has been regularly sniffing petrol should have a complete blood count. Um, serum electrolytes, looking for hypokalemia and metabolic acidosis. Uh, this is mostly associated with toluene. Um, the to this toluene is in generally glues and spray paints, but it's also in low aromatic fuel if we have got kids who do try sniffing low aromatic fuel. Um, lastly, urine rapid dipstick and microscopic urinalysis to assess renal tubular acidosis. And again, this is much more around chronic uh, toluene use, much more long-term uh, toluene use for that one. Uh, so when to call an ambulance? I mean, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, we can't call ambulances on every single kid who is sniffing. If their recovery is delayed, if, they, if we are sitting there at 30 minutes and they still appear out of it, that's a problem. Or if there's, um, all, you know, all of the other really obvious ones like not breathing or being unconscious or having difficulties breathing. Uh, sometimes people will stop using inhalants and after an hour, um, they're still not making much sense. It could be that they're, they are having a psychotic episode. Uh, they may have had a stroke. They could be, a, they could have diabetes, uh, having a diabetic hypo. We have seen this more than once now as well. So any delayed recovery is a, is a sign that you've got a problem. Um, recovery position is something we should be teaching our young people. Uh, we have had deaths associated with aspirating vomit. Uh, so teaching recovery position to young people who do use inhalants is good harm reduction. They can put their friends on the side and, you know, there's a nice little graphic to show you how you might do that with young people. It's quite fun and engaging to teach kids that as well. Um, so are there withdrawals when someone stops? Yeah, there can be, it, not always, but sometimes. It can be a bit hard to spot because a lot of these young people are using a range of other drugs too, like alcohol, cannabis and other things. And so it can sometimes be a bit hard to tease out exactly what we're seeing, but there are sometimes withdrawals. They're generally quite short acting because the substance is short acting. So generally two to five days would be the most we'd expect. And there's a few of the symptoms that we might see, but as I say, it's a bit hard to tell some of stuff because of the whole range of other um you know and also if someone is a young person is homeless then you know they're often um yeah using a range of substances or they've got all kinds of other you know um other, other sorts of uh health problems going on at the same time anyway so when to call the police, I mean, we, again, as I mentioned before, we can't call the police every time someone sniffs something. Um, you'll wear out the friendship with our colleagues in QPS quite quickly. Uh, but it, generally, we want to use the police when there's pro threats of, to safety of the young person or your, or your service or members of the public. Um, also, if you're worried about someone who needs medical attention, you can't get to them safely. And this can be including in situations like a young person sniffing on the roof of a building or in a really dangerous situation uh, where you can't get get access to them or the substance and to you know get that from them um, if you are finding yourselves calling police a lot for your service if this is occurring a lot then I'd suggest you have a meeting with your lo local child protection investigation unit or your officer in charge of your local station uh, and to sit down and work out a protocol around that because you know we can't rely on police are quite limited in what they can do I know police are very aware of sudden sniffing death and the risks of young people you know seeing a police car and running away and that is a legitimate concern and so we really can't be relying on QPS um, also I'll mention too it's not illegal to be sniffing uh, it's not there's no laws being broken in some of these cases I mean police can remove products from from young people they can take them to a place of safety in certain locations in Queensland but having said that I don't you know we don't really want to rely on police for this so we can work with police in partnership but um, police are not the one are not the ones that we should be calling on every time we have a problem with this so some of the evidence of what does work is limiting supply where we can in particular uh, you know limiting access to products uh, we need responses to intoxication there is some evidence around psychoeducation if you do this with young people who you know who you know quite well um, some of the strongest evidence is in activity based programs though that is where some of the best evidence is diversionary activity programs that do engage entire peer groups there's also evidence around connection to culture in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people. So return to country programs, cultural camps, uh, involvement of elders into the response and building identity. These are really key responses uh, for Aboriginal young people. 
Um, in terms of an individual young person who is using, I mean, most of these are the same approaches that we would use for a young person using any substance at all. Um, one thing I'll point out, though, is that generally um, a lot of the young people who are using inhalants heavily have got backgrounds of trauma. And so all of the approaches we would use for trauma are really important here. And that includes things like sensory approaches. Uh, Insight just launched a new trauma toolkit. So have a look on the Insight website for that, because I think those trauma-based approaches are really worth having a look at. Um, here's just a few young people. We are running out of time, but these are a few like little lines from young people around what worked for them. I once said, I stopped because probably I used to go to a youth service just when I lived on the street. So once he was no longer homeless, stopped sniffing. Another one said, I quit sniffing when I had my baby. Uh, when I was pregnant, I dropped sniffing when I had the baby. So as I mentioned before, people age out of it, they grow out of it. Um, services should be doing activities a lot more, like fishing, going out for barbecue, going to lookout. So a young person endorsing activity-based programs there. Uh, one young person said, I got some new friends and they didn't like me sniffing, so changed to the peer group. Uh, one young person said, I got sick of getting kicked out of where I was staying and it caused too many problems. So now I moved into my own place. I don't sniff, I can't sniff there anymore. Uh, and this last one, I reckon the problem starts from home. There's something wrong at home. That's why people sniff. I'd prefer my caseworker spoke to my family and not a different worker who doesn't know the family. Otherwise, you have to start from the start and explain it all again. So I think they're really good uh, little messages from young people there to keep in mind. Um, just finally, a couple of what not to do's. Lecturing them, you know, telling them how harmful it is, not useful. Um, scaring them, also not useful, unfortunately. If that was, if it was so simple, we would not have a problem. Um, coercing people, uh, workers who've got no relationship with a young person, trying to talk to them about it. Uh, the other one is broad-based education programs targeting non-users, not effective. We should not be trying it. Um, there is a bunch of collaborative responses underway around Queensland. I think some of the work in Cairns with the Coordinated Care for Vulnerable Young People, CCYP, program has been an excellent example of a collaborative response uh, around inhalant use. Um, we've got to keep communicating with people. We have to be flexible and responsive as the patterns change. Uh, we've got to keep on educating staff because as inhalant use shifts and changes, staff turn over and then people forget about it and we start again. But in general, we want to do supply, demand and harm reduction. We limit access to the products, we reduce the demand amongst young people who use inhalants, and then for those who are sniffing, we have to work with them to reduce the harm that they might experience from that. So, you know, it's good old fashioned supply, demand, harm reduction, harm minimization. Um, and then finally, there is some further reading for you. Uh, you can download, I believe there's a copy of this in the chat there, so you can download a whole bunch of different resources. Um, and Dovetail has also got a retailer kit as well, which is designed for youth workers to take into your local Bunnings or your local Coles and have a chat with them about the products that people might be inhaling. Uh, so you can order copies off our website there as well. But there's our contact details if you want to get in touch. Um, we are working from home at the moment, so email is best. But I should give some thanks to Laura Quinlan from CHQ for some of today's slides and also Genevieve Sinclair, Mandy and Bindi and all of the team up at Yeti in Cairns for the amazing work that those guys do uh, and you, particularly the research that they've managed to get, you know, to get the actual voices of young people into this is really, really valuable. So thank you. Um, that's all I've got time for. Do we have any questions? Thank you for that, Cameron. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, we have several questions. First of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to what was a very informative, but also I found quite a practical presentation, lots of useful strategies. Um, a prime example is one of the questions that we had come through was if you see a group of kids sniffing, would you approach them and how would you do that? And for example, I would suggest that that palms approach that you put up as a slide would be a really good way to start from uh, as to, you know, to consider how you would go up and approach those those individuals. But I think that's, you know, that's a personal thing, depending on the service that you work for and who you are as a person, whether you're confident enough to do that. But yeah, I thought it was an excellent presentation. Some of the questions that we have got, Cam, um, you talked about sudden sniffing death. And I know there's not a huge amount of research around that. Um, but somebody's asked is there any or are we aware of any differences in re relation to age or the uh, whether somebody's a male or a female as to the rates of uh, incidence of that 
Um, we don't know the answer to that one, unfortunately. So yeah, there's not there's no research around that uh, that describes that, unfortunately. Yeah, that, there, there, that, may, there might be something, but we don't know about that. And if any researchers are out there looking for a project, I think it would be something that we would certainly love to know more information about. Absolutely, um, would be a winner. Definitely. Uh, you described them as the presence at the beginning of your uh, presentation, but in a number of the quotes that were given by the people that use them, um, they speak about one was talking about talking to people that aren't there. So hallucinations, delusions seem to be something they experience. Is that common with these, with these depressants as you describe them? Yeah, look, it really is. Um, as you probably know, Jim, I don't like the category of stimulant depressant hallucinogen because sure. it's actually quite narrow and a lot of drugs have got mixed effects. You know, ketamine is one that has some depressant effects and hallucinogen effects too. So yeah, I think that um, the, the biological effect in general is best thought of as a CNS depressant, but yeah, that most people describe quite intense hallucinations. And in some cases, some of those hallucinations develop, uh, take on quite significant personal meaning to people. Uh, there are some young people describe um, hallucinating in ways that have important cultural meanings for them. Uh, and shared hallucinations across a groups of young people, which they rate as very significant amongst their peer groups. So I think actually understanding some of that direct experience people have is really important because we, I know many young people, and I think the Yeti report, the Yeti research that I quoted from today has a number of examples of that in there, which is really interesting for us to, to better understand. Sure. And I'd also uh, second Yeti, great service. What they're doing up there is amazing. I guess the question that comes from that, the hallucinations, are they typically only while someone's intoxicated or do they tend to be more protracted after use? In general, it should be just while intoxicated. Sure. So if we would expect that that should stop uh, as soon as they've recovered and that should be pretty quickly. Sure. If someone is still having those kinds of issues and it may be the case that they've got a psychotic illness, uh, like one of those quotes I mentioned, the young fella said he had the uh, the crack in his head. Yeah. Um, that that was an example of that, I think, that it, he had stopped sniffing it, but he still was having some quite strange thoughts. That leads on to another question that we got. I think this one actually came from Jason Ferris, who you know. Um, so what is the high period? I'm guessing, you know, that's how long is somebody intoxicated for? And in regards to one of the things that you spoke about was generally it's not a good idea to have a conversation with someone while they're intoxicated. So how long would you leave it after somebody's used before you actually engaged in that, that approach? Yeah, look, they should recover pretty quick. Like within, you know, 15 minutes, people will be aware of their surroundings. In some cases, it's starting to answer you appropriately. Generally, by 30 minutes, we'd expect most people are pretty much recovered. So I would say by the once they're answering appropriately, you're probably fine to carry on at that point. Sure. And yeah, generally 30 minutes, maybe 45. Yep, yep, no, that sounds like good advice. Um, I don't think, and I apologise if I missed it, um, somebody asked about developing tolerance to inhalants. So does tolerance de develop in the same way as it does to other substances? Yeah, we don't. It's this is a tricky one. Uh, we expect that we expect yes, it does. And just given the the num the rates that some workers are describing, if like some young people going through forty and fifty cans of Rexona in a day, that it sounds like tolerance. To there's me. a tolerance there. You would think. deodorant. So um, while there's not a, not much clinical research on that, I expect that that's probably true. Also, given that we know how GABA receptors work with the other drugs, and you know tolerance is is induced from these other drugs. And that kind of leads into another question, which you hinted at there that some people are using a lot. Somebody's asked how frequently or, um, you know, this is a how long is a piece of string question, I guess. But what is a typical pattern of use for somebody that uses inhalants? How many times a week are they using? How much are they likely to be using? And when it comes to, I guess, documenting how much they use, do we write how many cans of spray, that sort of thing? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think the vast majority of young people are probably experimental and only use once or twice. In, in this group we're talking about here, this really disadvantaged kind of group, I think that, uh, it, it, as you say, how long is a piece of string? 
in terms of your documentation, rather than noting how many cans, because you know, 50 cans uh, doesn't mean much to me. Yeah, it doesn't say a lot. I would instead write that up in terms of how much time are they spending intoxicated in an sure. average week. So it might be that what you know, he wakes up every Monday morning and from nine o'clock until about five o'clock, he's continually intoxicated. So I think that the period of time spent intoxicated is yeah, probably, probably more useful. Um, useful than exactly how many cans it sure. might, might have been consumed. Couple more to go if you're good for time, Cam. I've got, if someone is struggling to swallow, so when you were talking about offering somebody a drink to see what their response would be, um, if they were struggling, would you wait 10 minutes to try again? Or is that something that's likely to stay around and they probably need to go to hospital? Yeah, look, if they've, if they're very early in their recovery from inhaling use, so if they've just put the Rexona down five or 10 minutes ago, we'd probably expect them to not be great at swallowing. But if, it would depend how far along they are. How long has it been since they've been sniffing? If you're at the 20 minute or 30 minute mark and they're not swallowing right, I'd be getting, I'd be getting ready to phone the ambulance Definitely. at that point. Cool. Um, I've got a couple more. So sniffing, you mentioned in the conversation that sniffing itself is not illegal. Um, so where does the legality come with regards to uh, inhalants? Is it in the selling of the inhalants? It is an offence for a retailer to knowingly supply a product if they reasonably believe someone will misuse and inhale it. So that means if a young person rocks up to Coles with 20 cans of Rexona, then you can guess they're not using that to, for their... Sure. Uh, and uh, if the police is me but asking this question, so if, if it's not illegal and the police stop you know, somebody from doing it, you know, what in, in the process, what do they tend to charge them with? Is it uh, public nuisance offences? What's Well, look, there's, I mean, in general, a lot of times police are not looking to charge these young people at all. So police can remove a product from a young person. So if police find a group of kids who are sniffing Rexona in the park, police can legally uh, remove that product from them. So most of the time, that's as far as it goes. Okay. Uh, there can be some times when those interactions don't go well and we might get things like, you know, young people providing false names and things like that. So, but in general, our police are often not looking to charge them. They're generally looking to keep, make sure that they're safe. Um, so there, there are seven locations in Queensland where police have got the power to physically move a young person to a designated place of safety. And yeah. these are a bit of a remnant of the paint sniffing days from the early 2000s. Sure. So those powers are generally not being used, partly because we know QPS are rightly concerned about sudden sniffing death and young people absconding. And um, sometimes we know that, and police know this too, that their presence can inflame situations. So yeah, um, yeah the, the legal status is, is a little bit tricky. Sure. Thank you for clearing some of that up. Um, any feedback? Two more questions to go. Any feedback on how retailer, retailers sorry, have responded to the guidelines that you guys got together and put out? Yeah, look, it varies in, depending on your location. And so there are some locations where retailers are amazing and have done some incredible work and been really supportive and have partnered with youth organisations to try and manage it. Um, there are other places where retailers have been a little further back on the thought journey and have taken a bit of time to come to the understanding of their role in assisting on this. So yeah. that retailer guide is often used by a range of different people. In some towns in Queensland, police are the ones who go and distribute the retailer guide. And in some cases, police rocking up to a shop gets a bit of a better reception than a youth worker rocking up to a little shop. So if anybody is interested in that retailer work, give us a call um, because we can help talk you through it. And I know Yeti up in Cairns, as I mentioned before, have got a supply reduction position who specializes in retailer engagement. That's cool. And so they've got some amazing skills at, at how you do that. And essentially we want to go to retailers and tell them that look, we can help you. We can help reduce stock theft. We can help um, stop all the young people hanging out outside your shop. Uh, so we can help we can help the retailers to manage their stores better. So that's the, the framework people tend to use. Cool. Um, I think uh, I've just got another one come through. So if you run, if you're pushed for time, Cam, just let me know. No, I'm all um, good, Jim. What are the harm reduction? I know you mentioned some of them in your speech about you know not using plastic bags. Now, what are the harm reduction approaches for someone that uses inhalants? Um, so you know, avoiding the just don't do it. Um, particularly, they've mentioned you know filters, breaks between use, safe zones, those sort of things. So, do you want to just do a short yeah sure short thing two um, overview? 
there's a couple of things like as Jim mentioned plastic bags are, are dangerous and so one harm reduction method is the use of plastic bottles instead of plastic bags uh, if someone loses consciousness with a plastic bottle they'll just drop it on the ground whereas with a plastic bag can you know seal the mouth and people can suffocate um, also when people are bagging they're dropping their blood oxygen and really increasing the level of hydrocarbon in their system whereas with a bottle that just by the physics of it they're getting more oxygen in at the same time so that that is one thing uh, we often talk to services around um, basic first aid so recovery position is good harm minimization harm reduction um, talking to young people about when to call an ambulance that if their friend collapses that you know phoning triple o is a good thing some of the young people are really scared because yeah. of previous encounters with police or ambulance or whatever so early um, you know basic first aid basic emergency response processes are really good as well um, uh, there are a bunch of environmental harms around inhalant use, like the locations in which people sure. sniff, so often hiding away somewhere. So don't sniff alone is one that some of the deaths have occurred alone and no one's been there to help. Um, that's been some of the harm minimization. Uh, that's about it. It's a tricky I, one because it is, it is a tough one. You know, many, many services put out a lot of harm reduction brochures and leaflets and that sort of thing, but there isn't a great deal around the inhalants. One of the other things I would just add is um, Insight do do a, a full day workshop on harm reduction strategies and inhalants is a topic that we cover in that. So we do go over a few of the harm reduction ones, such as the ones that Cam's already mentioned. But if you're interested in harm reduction, that's definitely something that I would uh, encourage people to come along to when we start doing the full day workshops again. I have one final question, Cam. Are there any evidence-based or just really successful prevention programs that have worked for volatile substance use? Yeah, look, there, there is. Um, there's not an enormous amount, but there, yeah, there is a couple. And I think I mentioned during the talk, the Get Real Challenge, which was uh, developed by Indigenous Youth Health Service, it was, as it was known at the time. Um, I believe if you Google it, the Get Real Challenge Indigenous Youth Health Service, you'll actually find an evaluation of that program, which is still online. So, oh, look, it is too. Yeah, there's still an evaluation available. Um, this was an activity-based program that happened in Brisbane City in the early to, to mid-2000s that was evaluated and found to be successful. Uh, Brisbane Youth Service has done a similar one, which is also activity-based programs. So diversionary activities can be quite successful. We also know in Central Australia, in Central Australia this has been the case as well around petrol sniffing. After school activities uh, have been successful and uh, the Mount Theo program in Yundamu is another one that's worth having a look at. The Mount Theo outstation, essentially a treatment program for people who are sniffing, so not exactly for prevention, but there's a whole range of sort of youth work approaches that work as prevention in conjunction with the treatment approaches of those who are sniffing. So have a look at the Mount Theo outstation uh, there's a book written about that called Dog Ear Cafe, um, which you can have a look at. It's a really interesting story around how they did that. Uh, some of the other work, I'd say also I, one of the, um, the, there's an article that I've linked to in the further reading called The Review of Interventions into Inhalant, into VSM in Australia, which was published in 2008. That document goes through every intervention for inhalants that's been attempted since the 80s, wow. up until about 2008 when it was published. So that is that's a really, thorough. really good overview. And yeah. yes, correct. Mount Theo is only for Walpiri. And what, this is one of the issues with the inhalant use is that where the programs that do work are so community based. Um, that they're not easy to roll out to other communities. You can't just cookie cutter a program mm -hmm. from one location and drop it into another one. And that's one of the challenges we've had with inhalant use is that actually each community, each region needs its own particular response that yeah. works for its own young people and community.